This meeting is being recorded. All right, so um, we can talk about the uh, cardiovascular system. Uh, it used to be um, discussed all in the same breath with the lymphatic system. And now uh, usually those two systems are discussed as separate uh, entities, even though they're closely um, related. So we'll study lymphatic system as a, as a separate system. So you all already came up with all these functions of the cardiovascular system uh, in this transportation and distribution. You know, of course, it's moving around the blood, but of course, why is it doing that to move the, uh, get the oxygen to all of the tissues in the body and to remove the waste? And then Zoya also brought up, you know, all the other things that are being transported with this blood, right? We're moving the hormones, which are functioning in a similar way to the nervous system, but for slower signals. Um, so all those important things that we're bringing in and out through the blood. Um, transporting heat, uh, this one might be a little bit more mysterious to you. Uh, basically, the blood is warmer than the rest of the body. So the, the body can move uh, blood to the areas that you need to warm up. And one thing you need to understand to understand this is that you know, you might have a vision in your mind that the blood is just everywhere, but the body actually moves more blood to some areas and less blood to other areas and will kind of move the blood around as needed. So for example, when you're too cold, the body will uh, vasodilate, in other words, open the lumen of the deep vessels, arteries, and move the blood deep into the body to warm up your core organs. And convexly or conversely, if you're too uh, hot, the body can vasodilate the blood vessels superficially close to the surface uh, to release uh, heat uh, at the surface of the skin. Uh, the protection function, uh, if we're focusing primarily on the circulatory system and, you know, uh, we're looking in this case at both preventing hemorrhage, so the body's ability whenever there's uh, tears or breaks or cuts to uh, be able to create uh, a vascular plug and to, you know, heal that tissue. And then also, of course, the role of the you know, the white blood cells that can uh, mount a defense against pathogens, whether viruses or bacteria. Um, and the preventing hemorrhage, you know, I already spoke to that a little bit. <clears throat> Questions on that? When we talk about transportation and distribution, again, we talked about um, all the different types of things that are transported, you know, our respiratory gases, our, our oxygen, and carbon dioxide, nutrients, antibodies, hormones, uh, waste materials. Um, of course, the body is highly metabolically active. You know, even when we're asleep, the, the cells and tissues and organs are still metabolically active. And whenever there's metabolic activity, there's always waste products. So the body is always having to also get rid of those wastes. So we're doing that through the blood as well, which then of course gets filtered. So characteristics of blood, you know, some of this uh, might be review, some of this might be new. Um, it's viscous, in other words, it's, um, you know, it's a liquid that has a little bit of a, a thickness to it. Um, the pH is slightly alkaline. Um, the color, you know, can vary a little more uh, bright red to a little darker red. And as I said earlier, it's warmer than the rest of the body. Uh, the components of blood, um, this will be important to have a sense of both the um, distribution uh, or the um, the percentages of these different amounts. And so I would recommend if you're taking notes to draw uh, either like this is in a beaker with the plasma and the red blood cells uh, spun out in a centrifuge, 
or you can draw this, you know, sort of percentages as more of a pie chart or other diagram. Um, so <clears throat> we've got, you know, two, first of all, two basic components. We've got plasma and formed elements. The plasma has uh, water and solutes in it. And then the formed elements are the uh, cells as in the cell fragments. So we've got our erythrocytes, our red blood cells, leukocytes, our white blood cells, and thrombocytes, our platelets. And I know those are all kind of long words, but you should definitely know uh, the long word and the, you know, the common name for all three of those terms. So... Definitely. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, just so you know, for whatever reason, my sheet doesn't have the last slide or the one you're on right now. So I'm just letting you know. Okay. Um, um, it's It skips to like heart chambers and stuff like that. Okay. Well, if you could uh, just take notes on this page or look at your lecture notes, we'll have this as well. Thank you. Thanks for the heads up. I don't know what happened at the print shop. Um, so <clears throat> the plasma is about 55% of the blood. So again, here, this picture on the right is uh, <clears throat> if you take blood and you spin it out in a centrifuge, you'll have the plasma rise to the top. And then there's a thin buffy coat in the middle that's going to have your white blood cells and platelets. And then the red blood cells settle down to the bottom. And so we've got about... 55% plasma and about 45% red blood cells, you know, that takes up most of, most of the blood. Um, so, you know, we'll talk more extensively about the red blood cells, but, you know, this is the most, uh, these are the most abundant cells in the whole body. Um, and if I'm just going to repeat these in case you didn't catch it, because you should definitely know the names of all of these, uh, these erythrocytes, are your RBCs, which are your red blood cells. Your leukocytes are your white blood cells, your WBCs. And your thrombocytes are your platelets. And so the reason we call these formed elements instead of cells is because you know the red blood cells and white blood cells, they are cells. But the platelets, or excuse me, the thrombocytes, the platelets, um, they're called uh, cell fragments because they don't, they don't have all of the elements necessary to make them a living cell. Like they don't have all of the organelles and so forth. Um, this little drawing tool is hard to draw with. So please bear with me when I draw so slowly. Uh, so any questions about that piece there? Okay, so we'll look at some of these elements in a little more detail. This, uh, this chart, um, you know, most textbooks have something uh, similar to this and your free online textbook, um, you can also just use the search feature to put in components of blood and you'll, you'll come up with something like this. Now, I don't expect you to memorize, uh, you know, how many millions of uh, blood cells there are or the exact percentages of all these different components, uh, but rather a chart like this just gives you a sense of, you know, kind of the, the what's, what components are in each part of the blood, you know, some examples, um, and, you know, I wouldn't expect your licensing exam to get this detailed either. Uh, they might, uh, as far as, you know, what, uh, com what components are part of the plasma and so forth, but not the exact percentages. So let's start with the plasma, which is what's here up at top. Uh, so that's that real uh, liquidy part. Uh, it's a largely water, it's about 90, 91% water. And it's got about 7% proteins and examples of the type of proteins that are in this plasma are albumins, globulins, fibrinogens, um, 
The other solute, solutes dissolved in this plasma are things like your electrolytes, nutrients, gases. Uh, when they say regulatory substances, that's things like your hormones. Um, there's also vitamins and waste products. So that's kind of the, you know, what, what's happening in the liquid portion. And then in uh, the, the red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, um, you know, the, the main thing that's on this slide that wasn't on your previous one as far as the, the um, blood cells is the five different types of white blood cells. So um, that's what's here on the bottom right column. These are the five different types of white blood cells. You don't need to know that much about them. We will come circle back to them in a minute. Um, but the basic names of them, you've got neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. Um, the main questions you might expect on your licensing exam about you know, the white blood cells are the most abundant, are your neutrophils. Um, and um, yeah, that's, that's one of the main things to know about those. And we'll circle back to those. But onto the red blood cells, your erythrocytes. So this picture here on the right is a, uh, an electromicrograph scan of real red blood cells which I think is pretty cool. Um, let's talk about their features, their functions. Uh, I mean, obviously the red blood cells transport oxygen, so they can carry a lot of oxygen molecules per little red white blood cell. And they also carry carbon dioxide, you know, so they're exchanging between oxygen and carbon dioxide. Uh, the shape of them is a biconcave disc which you can see in uh, some of the electron micrograph slides, but of course you're seeing, you're seeing these at different angles. So, um, you know, I, if I was to draw one from the side, this biconcave disc is sort of like a barbell shape. And uh, can anybody think of why the red blood cells might have that shape? What is the purpose of a lot of the <coughs> shapes in the body? So they can go through tubes and bend. Awesome. Yeah. Things like one, that. That's one of the reasons. Excellent. So you can see that even like in this top right one, how it's, it folds and bends like that. So there's a part in the, um, the blood vessels where it gets to the smallest blood vessel is a capillary and they literally fit single file at that point. So they, they squeeze in there, awesome. Um, what else is uh, useful about the design of this uh, shape? Another uh, useful thing here is that this increases surface area. So the um, oxygen and carbon dioxide have to passively diffuse across this single layer of epithelial tissue. And uh, with this passive process, we want to increase the surface area to maximize our ability uh, for that diffusion. So that's another great uh, reason for that shape. Uh, another interesting and unique thing about the red blood cells is that they have no nucleus. They're anucleated. What do you think is going to be a result of them having no nucleus? And that's very unusual for a cell to be missing that major organelle. Any ideas what might happen to them because of that? Because this cell not divide this form in our bone. Ah, yeah, good it's thing. It's going to die easily. Yeah, both of those are awesome ideas. Excellent. Yeah, so um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to die quickly. It's not going to divide. It's going to be made somewhere else. Um, and uh, yeah, those are great ideas. And so these red blood cells, they only live for about 100 to 120 days. So your body is constantly making new red blood cells. And if you think about it, 
I mean, this is pretty impressive. They have a huge job bringing oxygen to all the tissues of our body. Um, and uh, so they wear out quickly. Um, so as they wear out, your body then recycles some of the materials and you know, creates new red blood cells. Um, <clears throat> so they're constantly being reproduced. And I mentioned this before, but I am really impressed by this fact. Uh, this is actually the most numerous of all your cells. Um, so, and these are all uh, functions and characteristics of the red blood cells that you should definitely know. Um, for your, you know, for your licensing exam. Uh, if we take one more quick little look here at the electron micrograph uh, picture here on the right, I just also want to point out that, um, you know, you can see in this diagram also platelets and little fibrin threads. So those are the parts that are responsible um, for uh, forming blood clots. So get all sticky like a spider web if we need to start, you know, blocking up uh, and creating a, uh, uh, blocking a blood from, you know, from, from bleeding. All right, let's, any questions on that? All right, so we're still on red blood cells here, your erythrocytes. Um, you know, we, they transport oxygen and carbon dioxide. Uh, the, the way that they're able to do that, I mean, you can, in a more advanced anatomy class, uh, you would look at the details of the hemoglobin here, but we're just kind of looking at the, the uh, basic uh, things here. Hemoglobin is a protein, and that's the part of the red blood cell that the oxygen and carbon dioxide actually bind to. Um, incidentally, that's also the part of the blood cell that gives blood its red color. And it's an iron-based protein. So any questions on the little red blood cells? All right. So our white blood cells, um, we're only going to be looking at broad strokes of the canvas here. I mean, you can get pretty detailed about um, each of the five types of white blood cells and their specific functions in the immune system. Uh, but we're going to kind of look at this a little more generally. Um, but you should know the basic five types of white blood cells, these um, basophils, eosinophils. Um, there's a typo on the spelling of eosinophils. Uh, let me correct that. So it's eosinophils, neutrophils, lymphocytes, and monocytes, and our most abundant ones there again are our neutrophils. Uh, while each of these do have uh, specific ways that they interact with the uh, or or functions uh, for the immune system, uh, these are you know basically uh, your immune or your defense cells some of which act by uh, engulfing the bacteria or viruses. Um, so this picture on the right, uh, we're seeing an example of how, um, you know, a white blood cell can be phagocytic and go around a bacteria. So it'll surround the bacteria and then use enzymes to break down that bacteria. We'll come back to the immune system when we look at the lymphatic system, and that's when we will take a more detailed look at other aspects, um, because it's not all about phagocytosis. There's actually complex reactions of how chemicals are used to attract the white blood cells to an area, and of course, which create, you know, memory cells and all of that. So we'll, we'll come back to that in the lymphatic system. And then last but not least, our thrombocytes, our platelets, um, you know, we saw a picture of those already, these uh, little fragmented, jagged uh, shaped uh, cell fragments that uh, are provide a critical part of the clotting mechanism when there's a break in a blood vessel, um, you know, a cut in the skin or 
internal bleeding. So the basic mechanism at play here, and this is an actual uh, micrograph um, of, of a real platelet clog, blood, blood clot here on the right. Um, if there's a cut or a break, the three basic steps are first, there's a vascular spasm. So to prevent more blood from coming to the area, there's a spasm and a, and a closing of the lumen of the blood supply to that area. So that's the first step. And then the platelets, those thrombocytes, uh, clog up the area and create a platelet plug. They physically block the area. And then they get all sticky. And the fibrinogen, which we saw the little uh, fibers of, this is a protein, these little web-like proteins, they transform to fibrin and basically make like a big spider web to block up the area. So that's the first step in blood clotting. And then the next steps involve, you know, creating um, new tissue to actually, you know, create a, a scar there and put down more collagen and to, to heal the area. Um, but when you talk about clotting mechanisms, um, you should just know these three major steps. Questions on that? All right, so this is the last concept we're gonna um, cover before we do a short activity pair and share to discuss uh, and take notes on uh, these concepts we covered so far. Um, so, you know, sometimes of course people have uh, impaired clotting mechanism. So when they have a cut uh, internally or externally, um, they um, have a harder time stopping the bleeding. Um, so, you know, of course uh, somebody might uh, have hemophilia which would be a, a pathological condition that results in this. Uh, but the thing that you're gonna see a lot more often in your massage practice is when clients are taking blood thinners. Uh, so blood thinners um, prevent this uh, clotting from happening. And a lot of clients are taking blood thinners after uh, uh, heart attacks, and other uh, heart uh, issues um, after surgeries preventatively. Um, so you're gonna see a lot of clients on blood thinners. Um, here, uh, the example aspirin is used because it can be taken in small doses for that purpose. Um, but your clients might also be on other blood thinners. Can you guys think of any names of other blood thinners? Is Coumadin a blood thinner? Yeah, yeah, excellent. That's a really common one. Excellent. Any others? What about Tylenol? Is uh, Tylenol one? That's a good thought. I think just aspirin uh, does that. Um, I don't think Tylenol has the same feature. Um, any others? So we got Coumadin and another really common one is uh, Warfarin. Um, so you're going to see a lot of clients on those. And then, so of course, your massage uh, considerations for this is that uh, your clients are going to bruise more easily. And so, you know, deep uh, massage is contraindicated. And particularly the techniques that uh, tend to make the bruising happen most easily would be like a cross fiber friction. Um, your clients are going to also, you know, there'll be evidence if they bruise easily. So kind of that they're on these blood thinners is sort of just a clue. Uh, but then you'll literally see if they have bruises on them at the time. And you also ask them if they bruise easily. Um, I always uh, bring bruises to their attention and I always chart bruises. So, you know, you don't want clients to think that you bruise them uh, uh, after the fact, because a lot of times they're not aware of all their bruises. So when you're massaging an area, if you come along a bruise, you can just bring it to their attention, you know, oh, did you know you had a bruise in this area? And then when you uh, 
chart it in your chart notes. You you make a note of where it was and how big. Um, so, yep. Yeah. So with that, would you also avoid like MFR and cupping, even though cupping, it's not a bruise, it's a mark, but do you avoid those? Uh, good question. Um, you could just, for the cupping, you could be more gentle with it. Um, when you're cupping, you'll really see if it's going to bruise, you'll see, uh, or if it's going to make a mark, you'll see the little petechia, the little dots start to arise. And that's, you know, you back off if that starts to happen. But if it's just getting a little pink, then that's okay. So just keep moving them more, not as many stagnant cups. Or... That's right. And not as, not as intensive suction. Right. And just, you know, just keeping an eye on them if they need to be lighter. Yeah. But yeah. And then MFR, that's a good question. Um, you know, usually it's okay. Yeah. It's not as, uh, it doesn't, usually make bruises as easily as like a, a cross fiber friction is kind of the most intense. So I'm gonna pause the recording here. Um, well, I'm gonna try to. Uh, so, but the, the type we're going to look at the most here is the ABO system and the R8 system. And so what this is, is basically that um, on the red blood cells, so I'm drawing, what I'm trying to draw is a biconcave disc. Um, on the surface uh, of the uh, red blood cells, there are sometimes uh, self antigens, which means it's a surface protein is the self part. Um, and uh, the antigen is a substance that can activate the immune system. So um, hopefully you recall, um, you know, what this little red line would, would uh, represent is the cell membrane of a red blood cell. And, you know, just a little membrane kind of uh, refresher, you know, we've got a phospholipid bilayer uh, but within that, so basically like a, a soap bubble, right? Because it's basically fat. But within that phospholipid bilayer, we have little lily pads of um, uh, other uh, substances. And then we have uh, lots of proteins, right? Some of the proteins go all the way through the membrane, which is how we can let substances go through, like for our, um, our sodium potassium pump and things like that. And then we also have surface marker proteins. And so that's the case here of these antigens. So in this little red blood cell, um, it would have a lot of surface proteins. Uh, let's say several people said they were type A. So the type A, their red blood cells are gonna have these surface antigens, uh, surface proteins, uh, with a antigen. Um, and then the folks who are B are going to have a B. And then the folks that are AB are going to have little A and Bs. And these take a while to draw. So I'm just going to draw a couple of them. And I'm just kind of drawing one to sort of represent this conceptually, but actually they would have a lot of these little markers. And then the person who is O, that's supposed to be a B. And then the person who is O does not have A or B. And so the thing is, then uh, I'm sure you've heard uh, the phrase universal donor and universal recipient. Um, somebody who is type O can be a universal donor because they don't have any of the little flags that people are going to react against. So the, if somebody was to donate blood that didn't have A or B flags on it, then there's nothing for uh, an A or a B or an AB person uh, to kind of react against. Um, this AB person 
is a universal recipient uh, because they've got the A's and the B's so they can receive from an A, a B, or an O. It's really hard to draw on this, but you get the recipient idea here. And then the A's can receive from A's or O's, et cetera. So what we want is, you know, like these are sort of self-identifying flags, if you will. And, you know, you don't want um, to receive blood that uh, your body is going to uh, mount a defense, an immune response against. Um, so that's the idea here. Um, questions about that? And of course, it's a very easy, simple test to see whether you're type A, B, or O. Um, you can uh, take a little tiny blood sample and with the right chemicals, see whether you uh, agglutinate or in other words, the blood kind of does a clotting reaction against the different substances. Yeah, Anna. Um, so A's, for example, could receive from A's or they can receive from O's, but they can't receive from A, B's? Right. Okay. Because they'll react against the B. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but as far as like a test question, what's more common rather than the who A can receive from? The more common question is the universal recipient and donor. Oh, that's cool. Um, someone sharing that they're a universal donor. Awesome. That's very handy blood. It's good that you donate. Your, your blood is, um, well, all the types are needed really. Um, and then there's another factor which you've probably heard about, um, you know, especially if, if you um, have, have uh, gone through a pregnancy, um, is an, another factor on the blood is an RH factor. So most people have an RH factor on the proteins on their red blood cells. And so they're RH positive, and that's the more common. Um, but some people are RH negative. And the issue is if uh, the, the mother is RH negative and the father is RH positive, usually the first pregnancy, that can be okay, but by the second, third, fourth pregnancies, there can be uh, immunity built up against that and that can be problematic for the baby. Um, however, there's medications for it. So this is just something that's tested for and then, you know, medications can be taken for it. No, no big deal. Um, questions about that? Zephyr, so if I'm A positive, is that, is the positive from the RH aspect of things or is, okay. Yes. Yep. Yep. Exactly. All right. So that's it for blood. Let's move on to the heart. And for this, I recommend that you, you know, draw little sketches as we go here and discuss the layers and so forth. Um, and we will take time. Uh, there was a handout also for the heart, but did you all bring this home with you? If not, we can do other drawings uh, as we practice. Did everyone bring home the, the heart worksheet or no? Do I see someone saying no? Okay. I didn't right. bring it. No. I'm sorry, what? I just said, no, I don't have it. Okay, someone else said that as well. We can do other uh, drawings and practice of this. Okay, so first we're gonna start with uh, the layers of the heart and the coverings. Um, so uh, protecting the heart, we have a pericardium and an epicardium. And then the layer of the heart that's actually muscle, the heart muscle is myocardium. And then the inside layer is endocardium. So, you know, again, you'll recognize these, you know, uh, prefixes of endo, the deepest layer, myo is muscle, and peri uh, is within, and epi is upon. Uh, one of the most important, uh, this is probably like the biggest, this and the blood are probably the biggest parts of the chapter um, and also the most common things to get tested on. Uh, so as we look at the heart, um, 
we're going to uh, first look at the anatomy, uh, the four chambers, um, the valves, um, and uh, those are the primary structures. And then we're going to look at the way the blood flows through the heart in uh, the circulation that goes uh, throughout the whole body and also to the lungs to pick up oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide. So first we're gonna look at the structures and then the way the blood flows through it. Um, so, and let me see if I missed something in the chat. Okay. Um, okay, so first the chambers of the heart. We've got in uh, humans, uh, we have four chambers. Uh, some, some animals have, you know, two chambers, but we've got four chambers. And uh, we first divide these into upper and lower chambers. So our upper chambers are called atria. And when we talk about two of them at the same time, atria is plural. I just circled the upper chambers in yellow. So atria plural. And if you're gonna talk about just one or the other, uh, singular is atrium. And you know, you know, like the uh, spaces, like architectural spaces, like an atria, it would be like the kind of the upper space with like the glass ceiling. So the atria here is our upper chamber. Our lower chambers, I'm going to circle now in orange. Our that is very hard to draw with this. Our lower chambers are poorly circled in orange. So those are ventricles. And I'm gonna clear that just because it's kind of messy. So question so far, upper and lower chambers? Okay, so between the chambers, you know, we've got blood flowing through the chambers and we need to uh, separate um, the chambers so that we can prevent backflow of blood and just have the blood flow into the chambers when we want it to, because the heart, you know, is constantly pumping, right? And we don't want the blood to always flow down with gravity, uh, like from the atria down to the ventricles at the wrong time. So we have uh, valves separating between the atria and between the tubes that enter and exit the heart. So um, there's a lot. Uh, a lot of uh, labeling here on this diagram, but let's take a look at the valves next. And some of them have more than one name. Um, let's take a look at the valves that separate atria from ventricles first. We've got over here on the right is our right atrioventricular valve which is also called a tricuspid valve. Now, it might have confused you that I appear to be drawing on the left side of the heart and I said the right. So keep in mind that we're uh, looking uh, as if we're looking at the front of a person here. So it's their heart. So you're orienting yourself that you're looking at an anterior view of a person so their right is seeming to be our left, if that makes sense. So the right atrioventricular valve is what I just circled here um, on the right side of the heart. Does that make sense or do you have a question about that piece? And just so you know, in all you know, anatomical drawings of the heart, uh, it's always oriented looking at it from the front. So whenever you're looking at a heart uh, anatomical drawing, uh, orient yourself that way so that, you know, you're looking at, um, you know, the right side of the heart as if it's looking at the patient. So uh, this right atrioventricular valve has two names. It's also the tricuspid valve. And this separates uh, the right atria from the right ventricle. On the right side, what's colored in here in blue, it separates the top and the bottom chambers. And so it's gonna prevent the backflow of blood when the bottom contracts. So when the ventricle contracts, we don't want the blood to shoot back up into the atrium. 
Uh, we want one-way flow of the blood in the direction of these arrows. So when the ventricle contracts, we have uh, the uh, right atrioventricular um, valve shuts. So it prevents the backflow of blood. Let's look at our next um, atrioventricular valve. So now on the left side, our left atrioventricular valve, which I'm circling in green right now, that is called the mitral valve. And it's also called the left atrioventricular valve. And it functions in the same way as the right atrioventricular valve. So when the ventricles contract, the right and left atrioventricular valves shut so that the blood cannot go back up into the atrium. So those are atrioventricular valves. And then we also have valves uh, between uh, the ventricles and the large vessels that exit the heart. So I'm gonna clear the drawings on the AV valves. And we're now gonna look at the valves between the ventricles and the vessels. So the right atrioventricular valve here in, excuse me, the right ventricle, so here in blue on the bottom, but leaving the heart, we have it going out to uh, pulmonary arteries right here. And so between here and here, we have a valve. And that is our pulmonary valve. So it's named after, you know, pulmonary like lung. And so this uh, vessel right here is exiting the heart to go out to the lungs. So our valve right here is our pulmonary valve. And similarly, exiting the left ventricle, so bottom chamber here in red, we also have a valve separating uh, where the heart is going to now exit from the left ventricle. And here it's gonna go out to the aorta. So our valve right there, I'm gonna circle now in orange, that's our aortic valve. So both of the valves that separate between the ventricles and the vessels are named after the vessel name of where they're exiting. So we've got our pulmonary artery right here. And so we've got a pulmonary valve and that's the one on the blue side here, which is the right. And then here we have the aortic valve separating the left ventricle and the aorta. Those are also called semilunar valves. So the full name you can use is pulmonary semilunar valve and aortic semilunar valve. But the purpose, the structure is a little different, but the purpose is the same in both cases. It's basically flaps of tissue that have attachments to them so that when the chamber contracts and blood is pushed, they, um, the, the valve shuts like this and prevents blood from flowing through. And when you hear, you know, when you listen to a heartbeat um, and you hear the, you know, sometimes it's called lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, that sound is actually not the contraction, that sound is actually the closing of the valves. And you've probably all heard, uh, and maybe you know some people that have had some trouble with their valves. And, um, you know, you can um, hear that when a doctor listens in a stethoscope. Um, you can hear if there's kind of a, instead of a lub dub, lub dub, there's like a squishy sound or other kind of, you know, funny sound that can be a problem with the valve closing. And um, I do have a, a surgery if you want to see um, the valves in action uh, of a replacement of that valve. And that's one of the um, heart surgeries that's quite successful if there's a problem with the valves. Um, any questions so far?
Okay, so let's now talk about the flow of the blood. Um, the blood is going to go, you know, throughout the entire body. And then it's going to come back to the heart um, after oxygen is diffused out into tissues. The blood is going to come back to the heart to get pumped to the lungs where it's picking up more oxygen, comes back to the heart, gets pumped out to the body. So let's, let's look at that step by step. We're going to look at it as if oxygen has already been diffused in a tissue. So let's pick an area of the body. Let's say blood traveled out to the hands and then the tissues of the hands received oxygen from the blood. So now the oxygen is going to, uh, excuse me, the blood is going to travel back to the heart. And because the oxygen diffused out, we now have oxygen low concentration in the blood. And so this is deoxygenated blood is going to travel back to the heart. In this diagram, deoxygenated blood or oxygen that has a low concentration of uh, uh, low concentration of oxygen is uh, indicated in blue. And so we're coming back, let's say from the hand, low concentration of oxygen, it's now gonna come back to the right side of the atrium. Now there's a couple places it can enter. If it was coming from the upper body, it's gonna come from into this superior vena cava. And I just, circling that and just drew an arrow. So from the upper body, the oxygenated blood is gonna enter this right atrium through the superior vena cava. If we're entering uh, deoxygenated blood from the lower body, we're gonna come, let's see where it is on this diagram. We're gonna come from the inferior vena cava, but we're also coming into this right atrium. So all the deoxygenated blood, wherever it's coming from the body, is going to go to the right atrium. There's just several entry points. There's actually one more that's not shown on this diagram, but the heart has its own blood supply. And so the deoxygenated blood from the heart directly has another place to enter, and that's called the coronary sinus. So questions on that piece, the deoxygenated blood coming back to the heart, and where it returns. Okay, so the next stop, and I'm gonna draw these arrows in a little bit darker. So we've taken our deoxygenated blood, it comes into the right atrium. Now the next stop is that this blood is gonna go down into the right ventricle now. And then from the right ventricle, it's gonna get pumped out to the pulmonary arteries. So this is the step at which the blood, you know, it doesn't have enough oxygen now. So it's now gonna go out to the lungs, you know, which are, you know, roughly to the left and right of the heart. So we go out to the left and right pulmonary arteries to pick up oxygen. Now, interestingly, you know, you may know that you know, most arteries uh, carry oxygen rich blood. Uh, this is the only place in the whole body where an artery is carrying oxygen, you know, low blood. And um, this is because arteries are always named for, you know, the vessels that go away from the heart. Um, so here we have uh, the pulmonary artery. Pulmonary for lung. And it's an artery going away from the heart. Here the blood is going to pick up oxygen. Now the oxygen rich blood is going to come back into the heart and it's going to come back in through the pulmonary veins. I'm going to use uh, this black right here. So we're now coming into the left atrium, the top chamber on the left from the right and left pulmonary veins. So we're now coming into this left atrium. 
oxygen rich. Now the blood goes down to the left ventricle, lower chamber. Now here we have oxygen rich blood and now it's ready to get pumped out to the rest of the body. So this is where the blood goes through aorta. And depending on which part of the aorta it goes, it's either going to get diverted to the upper body or the lower body or the thorax through the aorta. And so this is the part of the uh, contraction with our oxygen-rich blood where we need the strongest pump because the blood now has to get pushed out to the whole body. So you'll notice um, from most anatomical drawings, including this one, that the actual heart wall on the left ventricle is a lot thicker. And it's about five times as thick because the muscle here on the left ventricle needs to push the blood the farthest. Because you can imagine right in this um, right ventricle, the heart is only needing to pump the blood to the lungs, which are right next to it. Whereas here on the left ventricle, you know, we might need to be pumping blood all the way down to the toes or all the way out to the fingers. So how this pumping works is that we always have it right atria, excuse me, atria, then ventricles contract. So we've got atria, ventricles, atria, ventricles, atria, ventricles. The left and the right are both contracting as that's going on. And so we have this blood flow going nonstop. Any questions about that? Now, I just went through kind of a big circulation of blood through the whole body. And it's kind of, it's a lot of steps. So I think what it really takes is practice. Um, so what I'd like you to do is, you know, if you're, if you have a hard time sketching, um, you could literally use your computer screen to, um, you know, kind of uh, trace the heart or just draw a really rough drawing of the heart. It doesn't have to have the correct shapes of the chambers, but you'll want to draw two upper chambers, two lower chambers, and start practicing with the blood flow. And you'll want each chamber labeled and also the valves labeled. And it is extremely common practice, as you've probably seen before, to draw the oxygen uh, poor blood in blue and the oxygen rich blood in red because the oxygen rich blood, you know, that hemoglobin picking up the oxygen actually makes it a bright red, you know, so you'll actually see a difference in the color of blood if you're looking at blood from a vein or blood from an artery. So if you have colors at home, I would recommend that you also uh, draw this blood flow with your red and blue. It's gonna help you keep straight where it's going oxygen rich and where it's going oxygen poor. So what I'd like you to do is uh, practice a drawing by yourself first and make sure you've got all four chambers, all valves labeled, and then draw the pattern of the blood flow when it's oxygen poor and when it's oxygen rich. When does it go to the lungs? When does it come back from the lungs? When does it go out to the body? When does it come back to the body? And if you have colors, it's best to uh, follow the pattern of oxygen rich in red and oxygen poor in blue. And uh, after you practice drawing this by yourself, um, I'll have you work in a uh, breakout room to practice going over the flow of blood with your classmates. Um, so any questions? It doesn't matter if your drawing is really good or not. Again, the important thing is to practice the labeling of the chambers and the blood flow. So if it's a rough sketch of the chambers, uh, that's fine. Um, you're also going to need, you know, these pulmonary veins, arteries, and aorta in it for this to make sense. So I'm going to um, stop the recording. And... Um, do you think you need about uh, five or 10 minutes to draw this? About 10 minutes. Okay. So let's take 10 um, minutes.